Amazing. So welcome everyone to our first Dine in Discourse event with Paul. He's professor in HCI and president of the American Society for Cybernetics. Um, today, there are a couple little etiquette rules that I'm going to paste in the chat for you guys to keep in mind. Um, this is our first time trying it, so suggestions are always open and welcome. But for today, we, we came up with a couple of ideas that for questions, we'd like to keep them as verbal as possible. So um, if you wanna use the chat, that's great for sending resources, some side combos or notes, but for questions, let's try and keep the conversation dynamic and verbal. Um, Paul has told me before about um, interruptions. He said that he does enjoy interruptions. Um, I do. So let's I do- did it, I did it just then. Yeah. <laughs> So let's do um, like a, you, you can raise your Zoom hand. And if you have somewhere that you want to interject that you think is relevant, raise your Zoom hand and the person speaking, please try to just wrap up your current thought. Let's see how that goes. Um, I think that should be, that should be a pretty good way to facilitate interruptions. Um, I'm just going to be asking one question to Paul to kick us off. But after that, I'm going to be opening it up to all of you. So my goal is to not do any facilitating, um, is just to let it, you know, leave it up to you guys tonight. If there's, if there's a huge quiet area, then I'll, I'll jump in. But Paul also has that list of topics. So, um, you know, you're always welcome to reference those if there's topics that we haven't discussed yet that, that you have some thoughts on. And then I noticed that Nan's hopped in. Um, Nan's, do you wanna just give a, a brief intro to you? Just name, what you're studying and uh, a topic that you're interested in. Hey, Nance. Um, hi, Paul and everyone else. Yeah, Nan's uh, School of Design Masters, a topic I'm interested in is mutual aid. That's me. Great, thanks. Good to see you. Wonderful. So I'm just gonna open with a broad question for Paul. Uh -oh. um, this is something that I think everyone is wondering, first of all, is what exactly is cybernetics? Um, perhaps you can give us a little, a little intro about what excites you about cybernetics or tell us a little bit more about the American Society for Cybernetics. Wow, a three-pronged question. Okay. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I enjoy uh, the opportunity to talk about the subject as you might guess, and I appreciate your time and interest. I have a colleague who has for years not wanted to answer the question, what is cybernetics, but rather answer the question, when is cybernetics? Cybernetics is when you think about purpose of a system as being the most important thing, at least for that moment. And this is consistent with other definitions of cybernetics. Because the word cybernetics, maybe some of you have looked this up, comes from a Greek word, which has the same root as someone steering a ship, the pilot of a ship. Well, what's going on? Well, I'm in the ship. I'm trying to go there. I set out on my course, and then I get blown off by wind and tide. So I go, uh oh, I wanted to go there. I'm going here. I correct my action. And then maybe I oversteer and go too far, and then I correct again. So the word cybernetics has in it this idea of sensing what's going on, comparing to a goal and correcting action in order to achieve the goal, hopefully. Now that's an oversimplification of what cybernetics is, but it's the foundation. And that thing I just described is a first order, as we call it, feedback loop. It's a very simple feedback loop. And you see that feedback loop everywhere. And cybernetics began as a discipline when in the 1930s and 1940s, some scientists, some from physiology and biology, some from mathematics, some from other fields that we can talk about, started to say, wait a minute, there's a commonality of these systems, no matter what they're made out of. And the commonality is they all can be perceived as having a purpose. And in order to achieve the purpose, they have to follow this feedback loop, right? Because if I take an action and then I just don't pay any attention anymore, I probably won't get to my goal. So the constancy of moving through this loop, sensing, 
comparing to desired state, action to try to achieve the desired state, that action goes through the environment and I sense again and I go in a loop. Now that's what a thermostat in a heating system does. It's what a cruise control or what a Tesla car does in many dimensions. And of course you can layer, layer upon layer upon uh, feedback loops. You can change your goal, for example, humans do that all the time. So fundamentally cybernetics began in that era, 30s and 40s as a recognition and many, many scientists and scholars and linguists and humanists, not just technical science, but soft science, the so-called anthropology, linguistics, uh, sociology, other things came together and had these conversations through a series of meetings that took place in the 40s and 50s. And that was the groundwork of this field. The, your third question I remember, I'm not sure I remember the middle one, what excites me about cybernetics, I'll come back to that. The third one was, the American Society of Cybernetics has been around since about the 1960s. And it was founded by a couple of scientists, one of whom you might have heard of, a woman named Margaret Mead, who was important to the history of anthropology. Her husband for a time happened to be Gregory Bateson, also important to anthropology of that time, and still very influential, both of them. And so they started this society, Margaret Mead and some others started the society in recognition that a professional society to carry forward the ideas in some form would be valuable. And it's been going ever since. It's had its ups and downs. And I've been president for a little over a year. Let me tell you what excites me about cybernetics. When I was an undergrad and then working in a graduate, um, working as a research staff, it, it became a graduate position as a PhD student. I was interested in AI and computers, but also in humanities. I was always in both of those worlds. And there was something that always dissatisfied me about the AI of the time and about, I loved hacking and programming and writing code. And I've done that through most of my career, but there was something unsatisfying about it. And one day a guy walked into this lab I was at and he was talking cybernetics. And there was a humanism to his formal definition of the feedback loop sounds very cold and dispassionate, but there was a tremendous amount of humanism to this guy. He was also involved in theater and art and other things. He was an extraordinary character in his own right. And when I read his work, I, I saw AI, cybernetics, AI, so, yeah, cyber, give, give me this, give me the cybernetic stuff. Because it was both very formal, rigorous and actionable, I could write code based on reading it. And it felt more human to me than what AI of the time and certainly what AI of this time talks about. So what excited me was, it was a way of me doing what I wanted to do, which was to write code and understand systems, understand social systems. I also done a lot of consulting in organizational change, sort of a sub interest of mine. And cybernetics was a set of models a path to follow, powerful ideas that when you applied them brought insights. And that's true to this day. I still don't see anything that I would prefer to have studied or to be trying to carry on now. That's why I ran to be president of the American Society for Cybernetics, the ASC. I think that answers all three questions. Any threads from that anyone would like to tug on? Yes, I see a hand. Um, so how would you describe the difference between cybernetics as in right now versus like people who do like network analysis or uh, like complexity scientists um, or people who are um, doing, I guess, like design um, and like the, uh, as described by like the Joito's uh, work, uh, Joito's essay, Resisting Reduction. Um, I'm. I've been trying to figure out the connection for a while. I think I'm still kind of, uh, you know, we'd like pretty confused by that. It, it's a great question. For the first thing, numbers can be deceptive because the tendency is to say, oh, that's a number, that's real, that's true. But what cybernetics says is that you in your position of looking at something bring what you bring your biases, your values, your preferences, your language, your points of view. And in that bringing, you cannot 
claim that what you are looking at is true. You can only claim that from your perspective that it's true. So I can say I just measured the number five, but that implies that the value that I'm measuring, the temperature, right, the amount of light, uh, the number of people, the number of people who are in this income bracket, the number of people in this income bracket who live in a particular neighborhood, that's a preference for looking at things in that way. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to look at those things that way. I'm emphasizing only that cybernetics emphasizes that you are responsible for that point of view. And others may prefer to look at the data a different way, the same numbers from a different point of view with a different graph, with a different scatter plot, or just look at different numbers that are aspects of the same system. And what cybernetics insists on, and I will give you a metaphor for this in a moment, it insists that you are standing in a subjective place and that you're responsible for that subjectivity. Now, now let me explain what I mean. And please interrupt me if I'm not being clear at a moment. I, I think I'm, I'm more asking in terms of like the ongoing uh, work and research, like are complex system people doing cybernetics um, or they are kind of inspired by cybernetics but no longer following the tradition? They may or may not be. It depends on whether they think that they are dealing with reality or whether they're dealing with a framing or a view of what's out there that, that they are responsible for and subject to. It is a subjective stance instead of an objective stance. I, I think I can answer you a little bit with the following metaphor. I may have done this with Serene something. So I'm sitting here in my studio and you say, hey, what's your studio? And I can say, well, you know, I got some screens, I got a, uh, a rug, which I don't like, and I got some books over there. Why did I tell you those things? Well, I might think that those would be of interest to you, but no matter what, I'm responsible for the choices I make. So I just looked in the room and I gave you a description. And then I looked at my own looking. You said, why did you say those things? And I looked at my own looking and I realized, I, I, I don't know. Oh yes, I do know, because I thought you might be interested in those things. But why didn't I explain that there's a light here or the sunlight out there or the sound of a bird? So any looking that you do is imperfect, subject to your preferences, and you're responsible for it. That is the core of cybernetics. And there's a so-called shift between me just describing a system as I see it. Oh, the thermostat senses this, and then it decides to turn on the heater and the heater gets turned on and that changes the temperature of the room and then it gets hot enough so the sensor says the room is at the goal temperature and so it turns off the heater. I just described to you a heating system. But you can ask me, why did I describe it in those terms? Because I feel like that's conveying what I mean. I didn't tell you the color of the thermostat. I didn't tell you it's electrical. I didn't tell you it's over there, right? The point is, and I hate to say it again and again, there is a danger in science, and there is a danger in AI, and there is a danger in data visualization and in numbers to thinking you have access to the truth. And I'm going to tell you, it ain't so. That is one difference between cybernetics and et cetera. So there are, you could divide the people in the world who deal with systems as the people who embrace what I just said. It's an epistemology, right? It's a way of looking at how I learn versus those who say, I'm a systems person. I know how things work. Listen, oh, uh, you know, I, I'm just telling you the way it is. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not responsible. I'm a scientist, I'm objective, I'm not responsible, right? And this dichotomy is very important to me. Does that help? So it's more, um, it's more a philosophy, more a epistemology than a discipline itself. I wouldn't say more than. I would say it recognizes the inherent epistemology of its stance, the way science may or may not recognize its own epistemology or data visualization may or may not recognize its epistemology. The epistemology is explicit. Is that a fair distinction? Are you comfortable with that? People accuse it of being a philosophy 
And you heard my response. I, I, I didn't say you accused it. I mean, people dismiss it because they think it's only a philosophy. But hey, I've been writing code on this stuff for a long time. I don't think you can write code on philosophy necessarily, not to the degree that I can. I can show you pages of stuff that specifies the nature of learning in a way that all of this educational technology stuff never has. So I'm, I'm claiming that it is both specific and transparent in its epistemology, in what it, in the limits to what it claims to know. Wow, I wasn't expecting to go there right away. Thank you for that question. That's great. I just had a follow up on that. I guess you brought up a really good point that every factor has its own uh, kind of dangers, like dangers of AI, dangers of data analysis, and you know, dangers of just kind of carrying out any sort of statistical analysis to kind of figure out a reasoning of, or providing a reasoning for why things happen. So my question was, how has the misconception of cybernetics kind of being handled since AI and all these are definitive and we see it around us more common than we see cybernetics. And whenever we hear cybernetics, it's more like some sort of a fancy term to us. Like it's not known to the common man as like a figurative term that we would use in our common, uh, in our everyday life. So could you just shed a light on that? Yes, it's a great question. It's, you know, where'd it go, <laughs> right? You know, what happened to it? Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just throw a link in the chat, but I will also answer the question. This is a longer version. Yes, that's right. Um, th there's an abstract there and maybe some slides. Uh, no, no, there's no, there's no slides. Uh, there should be a paper there. Well, that's not, that's not useful. I'm sorry. Uh, I can get that for you later if you like. I thought on that page, there was a link to a paper about it. Um, so cybernetics comes along, 30s, 40s, 50s. And in the 50s, there was a reaction to cybernetics from people coming out of computing. So John McCarthy is a name you may know. I want to cover those who are interested in this, but not get too mired in it. Marvin Minsky was another. Um, and they didn't like some aspects of cybernetics. And so when they had their famous conference in 1956, they sought a word or a phrase that would be different such that they could separate themselves from it. And that was the birth of the phrase artificial intelligence. It's pretty artificial as far as I'm concerned. I'm not sure I'd want to attribute that to what I was working toward, but okay, I get it. It was, a, it was a contrast to natural intelligence, right? Or natural philosophy, which was the name of science centuries ago. So, all right, it's their name, let them live with it. So why did they want to leave it behind? Well, it's complicated. Norbert Wiener wrote a book called Cybernetics. So in addition to these meetings I mentioned earlier, Wiener's book kind of put it on the map. And Wiener was one of the guys in the 30s and 40s who started the ball rolling, but he was not the only one. And Wiener is a complicated character. Uh, he was in the, the space between all kinds of disciplines. He's a mathematician, of course, um, but he was working in cybernetics and people couldn't quite pin him down to a given field. He was at MIT for many years. And his students were weird. And after the war, after World War II, he repudiated doing science for the sake of a world that would make the atomic bomb. And he explicitly wrote a note saying, oh, I'm sorry, you've asked me about my research. I'm sorry, I, I can't seem to find it anymore. I, I don't know where it is. But what he was saying was, screw you, I'm not gonna work on this stuff. That made him unpopular, right? Certainly among the people who wanted to get more government money, and there were many of those. And of course, MIT ran on government money in those days, it may still. So that was a reason. But also at its core, if you say to a bunch of scientists, hi, you think you're objective? Nah, you're not objective. Science, cybernetics says you're not objective. It's not gonna make you friends, right? So for various political reasons, uh, scholars of a certain kind wanted to turn their back on the field and name something else, something else. Also, 
uh, the kinds of mechanisms that they were looking at in AI were a consequence of what digital computers can do. Cybernetics began independent of what it's made out of, what's the calculation going on? I don't care if it's a cell or homeostasis in the body or a social system or a thermostat or an autopilot. I don't care about what it's made out of. I only want to understand the processes. That's all more analog really than digital in a way. And yet it was very difficult in those days to build complex neural nets. So you might think neural nets were a recent invest in um, invention. Neural nets were invented around 1943 by two people working in cybernetics. If you know the name Marvin Minsky, one of the fathers of AI of an earlier period, his PhD thesis was in neural nets. And yet, when the digital computer came along, it was like, wow, let's see. It used to be the size of a room, and now it's the size of a desk. That's pretty good. It used to run at this speed and now it's running at 20,000 times the speed. That's good. It used to be able to play checkers and now it can play chess. That's good. Hey, we're on this path to making an intelligent machine out of digital computers. And eh, no, still hasn't happened. But that was the presumption. There's a strong reason for that. It's a little bit insider baseball. They weren't ridiculous in their logic. There was some theory involved in their logic. But that's the path they were on. So even if cybernetics kind of had its own way of moving forward and didn't have these political issues, the digital computer was taking over everyone's mind space. And cybernetics was not about what digital computers can do as much as AI of the time. So it's a little bit of a flavor. I'll try to dig out this paper, which goes into maybe just more detail about what I'm talking about. Uh, but but I hope that gives a little sense, Karan. Is it a little bit? Yeah, that was actually a very clarification of the timeline of how cybernetics came in and how today we are just talking about AI, which was a subset of cybernetics. So good to know that. Great. Actually, I found this is the link to the PDF. The other is a link to my talk. So if you want to go deeper, you can pull that out. That whole volume, by the way, which if you want, this is just my paper from it with some front matter and back matter. If you want that whole volume, I'd be happy to get you a copy. So we haven't talked about other things like design or writing code or complex social systems. Any preferences? I see a hand, Sam. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the social aspect of cybernetics because I, I don't I don't know anything about cybernetics yet, um, but like from the the um, introduction page that you linked that Serena sent, it seems like one of the core differences between like AI and cybernetics is AI is kind of like epistemologically focused on this like internal model of the world, whereas cybernetics I I think you use the word like conversations is like focused on like kind of social aspects of how we communicate um, with each other. I don't know if like agents communicating is the right way to phrase it, but. Um, I guess I'm, I'm like for the past couple of years, I've been like mulling over this idea that I haven't really had a good way to like put into words. Like I like to call it like models versus stories. And this sounds very similar to that. So I guess I was curious if you could expand on that aspect of it. Um, so models versus stories. Can you say a little more about that distinction first? Yeah. So I guess, so I, I don't think there's standard terms at all, but like uh, the way that I like to think about it is like a model is kind of a mathematical um, construct that you have maybe in your own mind or maybe on, on paper and in, in a computer that you can use to make predictions, like numerical predictions, whereas story, a story is something that you use to communicate um, meaning to someone else. Um, so like a, a story is, a, is like typically something that a human being finds compelling. Um, and so that seemed to like mesh very well with the description that I saw of like conversations versus uh, models um, in the um, and the intro to cybernetics. Interesting. Yeah, great. I, I like where you're going with that. So let me try to answer and as always uh, interrupt and so on. Um, you're right to pull out the fundamental difference that AI thinks that the intelligence is inside of a box or inside of a system or inside of a person. But cybernetics would say the intelligence is in the interaction. 
perhaps a conversation, which is a special case, more sophisticated, perhaps more uh, complex, more, more interesting in a way uh, than other kinds of interaction, right? I mean, I'm, I'm interacting with this right now. It's not a conversation. Right? I'm interacting with this right now, and I might be having a conversation in my head about it, but I'm probably not having a conversation with the device. Whereas now we are having, I hope, a conversation. So why is that significant? Well, there are many reasons. Um, some of this is in a uh, talk I've given in a couple of different forms. The consequence of thinking that intelligence is in something means that you think that it's the function of the, the rules, let's call it, inside or the models that are inside it, and that that stands alone independently from a situation that it's in. Even a minute ago when I talked about the feedback loop of cybernetics, right? it's the system in an environment that's either achieving its goal or not. So I'm sensing an environment, I'm thinking about my goal, I'm acting in the environment, and I'm seeing if I'm achieving my goal. So the fundamental cybernetic loop is interactional, right? It's connected. And uh, as I like to say, I have a, a friend who's a, who's a brilliant human being, but when he's walking around New York City, he's dumb because he almost gets killed all the time because he walks in the wrong direction or he steps off the curb and he doesn't see a car coming or he doesn't realize that just because it says it's a one-way street doesn't mean there's not gonna be somebody on a bicycle coming down at high speed with an Uber Eats delivery who's about to mow them down. So smart person, we say, but not in New York City. So isn't that a sort of demonstration or a story that it matters where you are as to whether or not you can be intelligent and, and that the capacity for intelligence is, is interaction. So that's, that's one story. Um, if I think that a machine is smart, then I am probably very willing for it to give me an answer. So if I ask something of Alexa and it gives me an answer, I think, well, it's smart, it must be right. But if I realize that the intelligence is in the interaction and that I have agency and it should be about me more than about its intelligence, then I might expect from that interaction my ability to ask it a question. Thank you for giving me that definition of that word or a place to eat, but I'm not sure. I've got some questions for you. I'm gonna ask you those questions. We, we can't do that with Alexa. Why not? Because the model is an AI model that the intelligence is in something and pulling out an answer from Wikipedia is sufficient. But if you have a cybernetic point of view, the Wikipedia answer is not necessarily sufficient because I'm me, I'm not some average, right? I have a particular need. So that answer you just gave me is inadequate for me. If I'm in a human to human conversation, we can have a, right? I can say, well, what did you mean by that? Or why didn't you say this? Or what did you mean by the difference between story and model? Because I wasn't quite sure what that meant. And now that I know, I can interact with you better. So there's a number of presumptions of which we're only talking about one. In digital media, digital culture, digital programming that distorts fundamentally what we as human beings are, including socially, right? Because if I assume that I am smart in my head and you ask me a question, then I'm just gonna give you my answer and I'm gonna be really self-satisfied. But if I realize it's in the interaction, I will give you an answer. And then I will realize that it's tentative, it's subjective, I'm responsible for it. And in a moment, I will wait for you to say, how was that? Did that answer your question? Do you feel like you've been heard? Do you have agency in this exchange? Or is it like Alexa where you take the answer or you leave it? Or like an Amazon recommendation or a YouTube what to watch next recommendation or anything that these computers do from a culture that presumes smart is inside. And therefore, here's the answer you want it. Oh, you don't want it? Okay. Here's an answer you want it, you want it? Okay, good. I got another one for you. So AI comes out of that culture we don't think about it that way, but that, those, these are the values behind AI. I got an alternative for you. I got cybernetics, right? And if that's of interest to you, I can talk about that endlessly to 
the kinds of algorithms you could write, what those algorithms allow by way of human agency, why they're better, in my view, than what machines do and so on. Aditi. Yeah, so you mentioned how AI is kind of like the knowledge is within a machine, as opposed to cybernetics, where it's like communicating and always like self-correcting. But where does like AI that learns fit into the spectrum? Yes. <laughs> Great question. Great question. So there's good news and bad news, in my opinion, right? The good news is it learns, but what is the algorithm by which it learns or what is the epistemology that it learns from? So let's talk about machine learning, which is, we don't think so these days, but machine learning is a special case of AI, right? And it's only grown in recent years for various reasons that you may know. It's not the only way of doing artificial intelligence. But machine learning assumes that by looking at patterns and by doing its magic and by being trained, and there are various ways of being trained. I don't know them all. I'm not an AI guy. I haven't followed it deeply for many years. But again, there's an assumption that if you look at all of the pictures of all of the cats and you say which ones are cats and which ones are not, then it's pretty good at figuring out which ones are cats. But with the assumption that the intelligence is inside and it isn't necessary to give agency to the person on the other end of that cat thing, then you end up, and you know the examples as well as I probably, with a judge who has a repeat offender in front of them who looks at the AI program and the AI program says, put this guy in jail because he's a repeat offender, he doesn't have a job, he's from a particular zip code, his income is terrible because statistically that matches this pattern. It's just like looking at cats. So this is a complaint I would have because the model, to go back to Sam's question, the model of AI in that case is that the aggregation of data and the ability to say, yeah, you know, 90% of the time it's right. Uh, you know, 67% of the time it's right. But when it's wrong, whoa. And somehow we accept that, whoa. You accept it when you watch a YouTube video that is suggested for you. 70% of the people who watch YouTube videos, this was a statistic I read a year ago. I don't know if it's still true, but it's still harrowing, still scary. 70% of the YouTube videos that are watched are watched because YouTube suggests them. It's not a question of you starting out from a link. Whoa, that's agency if I ever heard it. And it ain't my agency when I'm passively deciding to watch this or not. I may have drifted a little bit from your question, but. You yeah, so up. is it kind of missing like the human subjectivity part? Is that what we're saying? The subjectivity part and the agency part. Okay. I don't have agency in that exchange. Mm -hmm. In a human to human conversation, if it's a real conversation, then either side can interrupt, question, redirect, Etc. Can't do that in machines. I claim that that's unethical. People talk a lot about ethics and bias and AI and all kinds of things. I, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not um, steeped in those social issues. I mean, I'm concerned about them. I, I won't claim expertise in those issues, but, but what I will claim is that if you take away my agency, you take away my humanity. You take away my ability to be human, which is to make a decision. Now it's true that I can refuse it or I can accept it, but you know, human nature being what it is, eh, you know, sure, I'll watch that. Oh no, really? I'll watch the next one. Oh no, really? Oh my God, right? You're down the rabbit hole and you're you know, creating this polarization that you all know about. That's a consequence of the model, not in the strict mathematical, well, it's a consequence of the engagement algorithm, which is a strict model, but it's a consequence of the cultural model, if you will, of digital machines having intelligence inside. There was something else to go there, but I, I feel like I'm, I'm talking at length instead of listening more. Yes, Luke or Jaja? Yeah, um, some, something I'm really interested in, in or that I'm trying to understand more about cybernetics is it, it seems like in the definition, one of the 
important parts is this notion of a goal or preferred state that we try to work towards like through multiple rounds of feedback. And in the sense of these like so-called tame problems, whereby there's this clear definition of the preferred state that we're trying to get to, or a state that's like, that we agree on, that seems like a definition that makes a lot of sense. But I'm curious about these cases where you have like a so-called like wicked problems or problems whereby so as a society, we might not agree about what the preferred state is, or even have con contentious views among different people. And I'm kind of curious, like you, you sort of acknowledged this earlier about the framing that cybernetics brings to the table, but I'm kind of curious, like if cybernetics offers a path forward to what we should do when we might have like very different preferred states about the world. I think it does. I think it offers some things. It's a great question. Um, let me take a sort of two-pronged approach. First of all, who decides what the goal is? That's kind of behind what you're talking about. And if you're following this idea of surveillance capitalism, which is a fairly recently coined phrase from Shoshana Zuboff, she says, who decides, who decides, who decides? She's got three layers. And one of the issues, first of two prongs, is the decision process is not in my hands, it's not in your hands, it's probably not even the county's hands, it's in some complicated socio-technical complexity that involves local government, federal government, cultural norms, history, and so on. So wait a minute, that, that sounds terrible, that it's kind of, you know, paralyzes me right there. But the way forward, second prompt, is only in conversation can we understand where we agree, where we disagree as a community, a culture. Country is hard because it's so big and there are so many polarizing forces. But for me, it's only through conversation that one can understand others' points of view, maybe not to agree with them, understand them enough to respect them, and then to try to work them forward. So a lot yeah. of my work has been, sorry. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, no, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I guess like the part that, that stresses me out or that confuses, so we can in a conversation acknowledge different views and we can discuss these and there's different lenses for kind of navigating those differences. Yeah. But like when it comes down to the point of a decision, you know, the YouTube algorithm, do I, do I give this video or not, you know, do I, make yeah. some, take some action. And that's a binary choice. It's like discretized to the point where it's like hard to um, simultaneously, like, um, you know, it, it simultaneously adhere to like different, different ways of seeing things. And it's like the model is, as Sam would say, is sort of being, is reductive in a sense that the story is not. So what I would pick out of that, there are a couple of different ways to go, but what I would pick out of that is that point of interaction is fundamentally wrong. That if I'm only given a choice to, to accept or not to accept, it's fundamentally wrong. That's why I wanna replace that moment of interaction in interaction designs with software with a conversation. And that's also why I say that if that's all I'm given, that it's unethical. Come back to that or I can send you links. What a terrible thing to say, I can send you links. No, sorry. But I mean, there's other material that you go to if you want. Um, and I, I know we have limited time, so I'm trying to stay on point. So agency is for me the, the key aspect of that. And in order to, so agency. If we wanted to do something together, we couldn't do anything in a coordinated way until we agreed about it, right? So we're a team, we've got a, a problem statement, What's our design idea? We have to converse about that in order to agree on what it is. And we converse first based in shared values, shared language. We have to have an engagement. We have to go back and forth. We have to talk a lot. And then if we can't come to an agreement, then we can't cooperate. So the agreement thing is essential. So answering maybe a different question. Cybernetics, I think, has ways of thinking about how to have better conversations and how to have those conversations in a structure that can guide you toward reaching agreement or the point at which you realize you can only agree to disagree, at which point. But not coming to the point of understanding you well enough or vice versa 
and us constantly struggling and not realizing what the differences are, that's just a kind of stalemate and waste of time. So how do you use a process of conversation um, to get somewhere in sufficient agreement in order to act together? I'm gonna go a little further, that was a little vague. And also you mentioned wicked problems. And if those of you are not familiar with the technical meaning of wicked problems, then it's a whole world in itself. Um, and as you started to say, a wicked problem is one where you can't agree on what the problem is. Does everyone know wicked problems by definition? A few of you do. Let me give you a quick example. And Luke and uh, Sam and others who know what it means, you can tell me if you like this or not. So I want to cure homelessness, OK? I'm going to do it. Are you ready? I'm going to do it. I'm going to build a bunch of homes. See, there, I'm done. Now, your reaction might be, well, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? Having homes doesn't solve homelessness. Oh, why not, I say? Well, because the people who are homeless on the street can't afford the homes. Oh, they can't afford it. Okay, so the problem is they need a job? Well, yeah, they need a job. Okay, fine, so I'm gonna make a bunch of jobs. And you say, well, but, but wait a minute, they don't have the skills for jobs or they have mental health issues or whatever. So it's a kind of whack-a-mole situation where is the problem of homelessness, jobs, employment, mental health, uh, racial and social inequity, and the answer is sort of yes, right? It's all of those things. And now the challenge is, what do we work on? What do we agree is our action in the context where there are so many different conjoint problems, all of which contribute to homelessness? That's a wicked problem. And the more you study it, the more you realize that wicked problems, which come substantially from a guy named Horst Rittel, R-I-T-T-E-L, you may know the name, you know. He was at a school in Germany in the 1950s where who drifted through but Norbert Wiener, Gordon Pass, and other cyberneticians. So cybernetics had an influence on the development of wicked problems, which is, which is interesting, right? I'm not trying to claim something, but it makes sense, right, that the subjectivity involved in looking at the framing, sorry, looking at the problem of homelessness from the frame of needing homes or from the frame of needing education or the front. That's about the stance that you take when you look at the world and the consequences of that stance. What have I left out and not addressed in what you've asked so far? Or where would you like to go? Jaja, did you raise your hand? You can just unmute. Oh yeah, we were saying too, if someone else who hasn't talked yet wants to like ask a question, feel free to. Hi, um, I think that's a good segue for me. My name is Molly. Um, I wasn't here for introductions. Uh, so like, I would just say that like, I'm a computational design master's student and I'm pretty interested in like reinterpreting or, or, or having a new understanding of what technology is because I, uh, a little bit of context. I grew up in Hawaii where there's a lot of indigenous culture. And so I feel like my view of technology is, is a little bit different in, 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 in opposed to like our mechanistic, like electronic vision of that as we so see it today. But I suppose my question more along, more along aligns with um, like, it, it feels that um, like understanding artificial intelligence, understanding cybernetics, understanding like um, these sort of almost like techno industrial ways of, 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 of understanding technology and understanding like uh, uh, future forward like processes and thinking seems to be very much where we are right now. But it also feels that like we're sort of dancing around the fact that, that like um, I guess social embedded systems like are the basis of this. Like for instance, like humans use technologies, humans develop technology. And so um, I, I just wanna ask basically like, uh, I, I think there's a lot of, 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 of bias 
that like development comes with the development of technology and progress comes with the development of, of technology. But what is your view upon like, like how like people and uh, people can develop further through, I guess, like more humanist means, more social means. And, and, and what does like innovation look like on a social level so that perhaps our understanding of how to develop and how to, to, to move forward is, is centered in something that is, I think is advantageous for, for people and not just for the sake of a tool. It's beautiful, Molly, thank you. It's a very broad and inviting question. Um, as I said a little bit at the very beginning, and I'll say a little more about now, I've always been interested in both the humanities and social systems and soft sciences, as well as the so-called harder sciences and computer science. I have two older brothers, each of which you could say represents the one and the other. And I was exposed to a lot of weird stuff when I was young. And that showed me the synergy across those two things and how each has its own explanatory power or engineering uh, directions uh, or progress in a technical sense or humanity and empathy and consideration for others uh, in the human sense. And so an easy answer um, to your, your question is uh, get everybody in the School of Computer Science to study humanities. I don't mean that to be glib. I mean that to be real. Um, I mean, you come out of comp you're in computational design, which is a great program. I'm, I'm very uh, interested in what goes on there, and, and Daniel Cardozo's work and so on. Um, there, in architecture, you're wanting to conserve the value of design and creativity, and yet harness this masterful digital machine to help you do the process of designing. And I, I have some interest in history in that as well. Um, so I, I think you're in an interesting space and you also come from an interesting background where if you hold on to that, and I feel that you will, uh, you'll bring a lot to it that others can't bring to it because of where you're coming from. So these are, these are generalities. These aren't necessarily uh, uh, valuable specifics yet in that direction, valuable specifics. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on that I think Serena knows a little bit about is if I or we or some group wants to respond to these disadvantages of being technically obsessed and the digital culture that I alluded to that, for example, makes you think that interaction is, uh, sorry, that intelligence is inside something rather than interactional, I would like to build a parallel universe of alternative algorithms, case studies, exemplars, prototypes, artists' works, architectural works, which are more, and I mean this metaphorically, analog in nature. So instead of obsessed in the digital senses that we're talking about here, obsessed in an analog sensibility in order to get more of a balance. I don't want to throw out computers. I've had a lot of fun programming them for a long time, as I said, but I also want to put them in their place. And the trouble with today's culture is it's overtaken us. AI has overtaken us, right? AI is everywhere. It determines the world that we live in and the world that we see. That sounds like hyperbole, but I think it's more true than not. Anybody who has a smartphone, I think is subject to a, a very serious distortion in the world that they live in. I include myself in that. Maybe that's why I'm trying to find it. So could we come along and, for example, take the history of the relationship to the earth that indigenous cultures have, the relationship to ideas and values and literature and art and music and opera that the history, not just of Western culture has, but all cultures have, because music and art and society are universal to being human. Can we bring all of those together in a, in a way of studying? So SDS, right, socio-technical systems, to some extent are scratching the surface of this, but I don't think they go deep enough. So my response, I hope Molly, this is making 
some sense in responding to you. Um, steeping ourselves in those things rather than saying, hey, smaller, cheaper, faster, all I need to do is be able to program Python better and I'm good. That's the problem of the world that we have today. Molly, is that a little bit responsive to you? To yeah, it was. I, it, I think it also um, is a response to how vague my question was, but because you, 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 I think you, you talk, but either way you touched on some very like valuable things. I suppose um, more specifically, I, I guess I'm just really um, interested in 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 like what does social innovation looks like, like like how how can how, like like in a conversation where innovation and and cheaper better faster is is a part of the dialogue like how how is one able to sort of interject that that socially this is also applicable and this is also like very important for us to move forward. It's a beautiful question. I, uh, I don't think I can answer it specifically other than to say, what I'm interpreting you to ask is, how can we configure ourselves to do social innovation? There are programs on social innovation. Where I taught for a while in New York City as an adjunct, the um, School of Visual Arts has a a DSI, a Design for Social Innovation Master's Program. And there are others around. I would suspect that CMU has something like that. I don't know offhand which one would be closest. Um, I think it looks like being transdisciplinary in the way that this group is intended to be and in the way I was just talking about in broad strokes as the human side and the technical side or the analog and the digital, if I can oversimplify it in that way. I, I, I don't know how to answer you, Molly, but I, I think you have a, you have a journey uh, in front of you, if that's if that's what you're interested in. Maybe that is the question of the era, right? Maybe that is the question that leads to dealing with social injustice, climate change, political uh, polarization, you know, being Ukrainian. I'm not sure. It's a difficult moment. That's the best I can do. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the question. I just had a quick comment um, on your last answer to Molly's first question, but based on your answer, would you say that cybernetics has more of a tie-in to like anthropology and psychology than maybe some of these other fields like computing and AI? Um, it certainly has a deep tie and a deep history in anthropology, sociology, linguistics, philosophy. And if you go back to the meetings that I was referring to in the 1940s and 1950s, which you can look up, uh, they're called the Macy meetings, M-A-C-Y, because a, a foundation called the Macy Foundation funded them in the 40s and 50s. And they were famous for being the first very, very broadly transdisciplinary conversations. And that was the word we say interdisciplinary today. Trans has a slightly different nuance, but for our purposes here, it's essentially the same. And so the design of those meetings over about 10 years by one person in particular, who was a philosopher, a neurobiologist and a poet, uh, was to bring these different groups together and to argue about stuff. And they were not easy meetings, apparently. Margaret Mead was there a lot, Gregory Bateson, as I said earlier, but, and, but many other people in many other fields, John von Neumann, who you'll recognize uh, from computer science and others. And the goal was to mash uh, the conversation together in order to work across these disciplines in a way. Now, also I would claim that the beauty or the power, the beauty and the power, the beauty is the power, power is the beauty of cybernetics that it also bridges the technologies and the AI and the digital computers because it has a lot to say about those technicalities. And as I said before, uh, a guy by the name of McCullough, Warren McCullough and Walter Pitts invented neural nets in 1943 and they were at the beginning of cybernetics. 
and they wrote some interesting papers and explored some things. And then some people did neural nets for a while and then stopped because the digital machine and programming seemed to be advancing smaller, cheaper, faster at such a rate that that would be better. And then, well, it's a complicated political story. Basically the guys in AI tried to kill uh, neural nets. And they, they, they literally wrote papers saying, ah, these are never gonna work. And then some guy in the eighties, Jeffrey Hinton, who was at CMU for a time said, wait a minute, really? I'm gonna look at those again. And then nothing happened until the internet when data was available at scale and CPUs got smaller, cheaper, faster, and you could do the calculation of the neural net. And now we're in this terrible world that we're in. I'm sorry, did I, did, was that, that sound biased? Nance, help me. Um, I'm gonna take the conversation in a slightly different route. Um, I wanted to ask um, uh, if Gordon pa Pask was alive today, what would be some of the things he'd be interested in inquiring about? Um, it's a wonderful question. So Naz is talking about my PhD advisor and the guy that I left what I was doing because he walked in one day and I realized that it was cybernetics that I wanted and not AI. I told a little bit of that story earlier. Um, it's a great question. I think that he would be, first of all, re-recognized as someone who had been there before anyone else had been or before most others had been. Because a lot of the issues that we have today, he talked about, a lot of the machines we're building today, he built versions of, but better. And I think he would be admonishing us to pay more attention to the social side. I mean, this is a deeper question than I should be doing uh, an improv on. But he wrote a paper, for example, called The Limits of Togetherness, which you can find on the web. And one of the ideas there is if we're, if we're too much together, we lose our humanity, by which he meant if we all think the same thing, then we don't have anything to say to one another. And you might say that the polarization of the right versus the left, if I can oversimplify it that way, is an example of what he was worried about. Because if you all believe the same thing, you don't get anywhere. You go deeper down the rabbit hole. You don't generate new ideas. You don't challenge the ideas you have. So I think you would be concerned about where we are with the polarization today as a consequence of these things going at scale. The other thing you would say is that this whole neural net thing when applied to engagement algorithms and YouTube videos and the stuff we've been talking about, Facebook newsfeed, uh, you're doing the exact opposite of what you really should be doing interactionally. And this is a little bit sort of algorithmic, but the, the problem with the machine learning algorithms is they, they generalize, they average, and then they give you something based on this average. But you now are a particular human being and you now should also have the right to have agency and to say, not just yes or no, but I have this question. I'm not sure what you're saying. Can you clarify and so on? As we talked about earlier, to be able to have a true conversation in that moment of decision before you say, yes, I want to watch the video or no, I don't want to watch the video. And he built programs to do this starting in the 1950s and the 1960s. And he got quite far given limited technology, mini computers and stuff. He built a system in the mid 1970s in which he couldn't fit all of the data on a floppy disk, which was the medium of the time. And so when he wanted uh, someone to read something, he built a bunch of bookshelves and a little LED light would go on at the top of the bookshelf slot and the reader would pull out a clipboard and read the page because it wouldn't fit on the floppy disk. So he wasn't limited by technology, right? He had an idea that he could execute even in a context like that. So I think he would come forward again with some of his innovations that are largely ignored today, always from the point of view of wanting to preserve what it means in his mind to be human, which is very much about agency and about conversation. 
So that maybe that's a partial answer. Rahul, you've had your hand up for some time. So um, I just I'm having some trouble wrapping my head around uh, this parallel universe that you mentioned. Um, so in the sense, could you? I'm sorry, the which I missed it. The... Yeah, no, I just wanted to understand uh, some examples of maybe code or ah. what even tech products that would benefit from. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great. No, it's a favorite topic of mine. You'll have to stop me. So when you go to a web page and you click on a link, you, this page comes up, right? Well, if you were in a human to human conversation and you had access to the author of that page, you might say to the author, hi, I'm over here and I see there's a link. And if I click on the link, I get your 3000 words. But can you help me for a minute? You wrote those 3,000 words. What should I know? You know, just capsulize what you think is important to me. Now, that author of that page, if they knew something about you, like what you know and don't know, what your interests are, maybe where that link is, what the context of the link is, what's the paragraph surrounding it, what's the page that it's on, what's the text that is the hyperlink, the person who is the author would tell you something very different than would tell Serena, than would tell Sam, et cetera, because it would be personalized in a very specific way. I've written code to do that, where you roll over the link, the algorithm goes to the page, scrapes the page, segments the page, and then says, oh, Rahul's there and has this context and knows these things. Is this a good paragraph for him? No, 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 he knows all that. Is this a good paragraph for him? No, that's completely unrelated. Is this a good paragraph? Oh, this is a paragraph that has some connections to what he's interested in and what he's just asked about, but also has something new. And it would pick that paragraph and show you that paragraph in a pop-up window. I built this around 2014, 2015. I've got videos, I can show you some demos. So it wasn't as good as a human being who knows you, but in real time, you're on a page, you roll over and it goes, Foom! and it gives you a paragraph as if you had clicked on that link and went to the page and found the thing that was most appropriate for you in that moment. That's an application of Gordon Pask's ideas of how knowledge works his heuristics for deciding on what's new, such that you're not bored and being told something you know already, but not so new that it's incomprehensible, right? And it's as if you were kind of having a conversation where you maintain the agency, but the system is also trying to have some agency as well, to know you enough to make a particular decision. So that's one example. Is that tangible enough to answer the question? Yes. Um, would that also require a compromise in terms of privacy, data privacy? Would you have to know more about the user? So there are two architectural forms of that, the one that we built of that era and the one that we would build today. In that era, yes. In the cloud, the system knows what you've looked at, blah, blah, blah. Probably a lot less than Facebook knows about you right now. But still, because we're not... In particular, we weren't tracking um, financial information or where you had gone and stuff like that, but in a, in a sort of information space and knew a lot about you. But we only built it that way because in those days, six, eight years ago, it was too hard with the amount of money we had and under the circumstances to demonstrate what we really wanted to build, which was all of that is computed locally. Okay. Right. So you would need to download the model of the content that you, we extract in real time. And then locally it would do this uh, calculation and has a technical name that I'll try to avoid uh, for deciding which paragraph is the right one for you. And that could be done locally today. You could probably do it distributed and encrypted in other ways, um, but uh, another great question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
we doing? One of your questions was, will automation or augmentation be a bigger trend with AI in the 21st century? What do you think I think the answer is? Absolutely. It's taken over the planet. That's what I was trying to say earlier. That AI is determining way too much of what we see and what we know. And Norbert Wiener was worried about that in the 1950s. And he, he wrote a wonderful book that I recommend. It's very readable. Well, the, the cybernetics book is not very readable. It's full of a lot of mathematics that I certainly didn't understand. But he wrote another book called The Human Use of Human Beings. And in fact, I just misquoted the title. Serena may know that I love this point. If you look at the original edition, it says the human use of human beings. It's italicized. The human use of human beings. And he talks a lot about prediction about automation. He didn't imagine where we are today with, the, with Facebook and data and stuff like that, but he was worried about privacy. He was worried about automating things. He was worried about a system that learns. And he has a wonderful quote that maybe if I can find it in a, only a, a couple of minutes, that is a warning that feels like something you might've written today. And I'll just take a moment of silence while I look for it. Here it comes. Okay to read a long quote. So this is Norbert Wiener, excuse me, 1949. If we move in the direction of making machines which learn and whose behavior is modified by experience, right? It's a particular kind of learning beyond just accumulating knowledge, but behaving differently. Behavior is modified by experience. We must face the fact that every degree of independence we give the machine is a degree of possible defiance of our wishes. Defiance, the machine is defiant about what we want because we have given it this capability of learning and of changing its behavior. And that independence may be something we don't want. Facebook algorithms, right? We let it do what it does. And whoa, I didn't think that would happen. And of course, the problem with Facebook is they know what's happening and they still unchange their algorithm, right? Am, 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 I, am I saying something that's either surprising or untrue? I don't think so. They know what's going on. They're not stupid. Well, Zuckerberg didn't graduate college. I'm sorry, uh, that, that sounds like a, a bias about having a degree. I don't mean that. I'm just trying to make fun of the man who some have said <laughs> is a threat to democracy itself. But don't let me veer into the political. Oh, I'm sorry, I've been that way the whole time. Of course I'm political. Everyone is political. You can't avoid that, right? Oh, is this a, a recent comment from Tom? So how would the next five years look if cybernetics was implemented at the grassroots level? Well, I don't think it would take away Facebook because there would still be, great question, thank you. There would still be this desire for the bottom line and quarterly earnings and all of the corporate stuff that we know about. But my hope is that by having alternatives, I described this a little bit earlier in this project I'm working on, that if a designer or a student or an entrepreneur or a venture capitalist or anyone could say, oh, there's an AI way of doing it and there's a cybernetic way of doing it. That's interesting. Do they both work? Yeah, they both work, that's cool. Uh, this way would make me more money, but do I care about the difference between 3 billion and 4 billion? No. This would make me 3 billion? Okay, that's more human. I'll go that way. But I want this to be as tangible as this. Right? I don't wanna wave my hands, which is what I do today mostly, and say cybernetics is better and ask you to come my way and to at least understand what I'm saying. The example of the algorithm I was mentioning is real. I've written it 
many times, and there are other algorithms and other interfaces that I'm happy to talk about and I can show you demos of. They're just one of a whole panoply of ideas that I would like to get out there such that all of you and all of these communities I'm talking about, designers, engineers, et cetera, could look and then make the decision. I'm not gonna coerce them to do one or the other, but I'm gonna offer alternatives. We don't have these alternatives now because cybernetics is not well known. There aren't many people who are using it for implementation. And this other stuff is, wow, I can get money by snapping my fingers and create a unicorn, count me in. Or I can work for Facebook. Wow, I just got a degree, cool. Can I work for Facebook? Yeah, I can, okay. Not my responsibility about what they're doing. That's what some people say. So how would it look? I don't know. I don't know where it ends up. Again, it doesn't destroy Facebook, but at least it gives an alternative path for some, and maybe the grassroots would work. There's a famous quote, excuse me a second. Speaking of Margaret Mead, you may know this quote. Isn't that a great quote? It is the only thing that ever has a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens. I still find it hard to believe, but I want to believe it because, you know, changing a government. Well, again, I mean, the Ukrainians are an amazing example. You know what they're doing over there, those Ukrainians. They're pulling out their guns. It's really amazing. Anyway, so one hopes that there could be a grassroots change that would have some, some positive impact and offer alternatives. And maybe the other part that has to happen is the education system, certainly in this country, would need to be improved such that people can think for themselves and understand what the trade-offs are, what the balances are, and make the decisions for themselves that are better for the collective good instead of for their individual good, because we're all in this together. Actually, I just have to add on the question that I asked. So actually, I was just even curious to know, like, would all the systems out there, like if like we didn't have AI altogether and it was just cybernetics that worked on, would things be more transparent? Is that like where this would head like because I'm thinking like if all the decision lies with the user itself, like suppose if I was using Facebook and Facebook didn't have the recommendation system, that's like where I've sold myself technically for the data that for the recommendation system that Facebook uses. So is, is that if that cybernetics was the main basis on which Facebook was made that I would make conscious decisions and I would be kind of the sole uh, decision maker at the end of the day, is that like how it would be something like that? The only thing that I would ask you to look at is the word soul decision maker. Because the decision is in the interaction. It depends on what you're presented with as well as what your reaction to. But yes, much more so, you would be involved as an agent in those decisions. And maybe that's where the grassroots thing comes from. Maybe instead of the lack of agency in the YouTube algorithms and the Facebook feed algorithms creating more and more polarization. Maybe if there were more engagement and more agency of the human side, there, there would be more questioning of what came their way, or it wouldn't be forcing people down the rabbit hole. Maybe you would create a Facebook in which people of slightly opposing views are joined. And then if that works, join them to those who oppose them even more and oppose them even more and oppose them even more until a point, I don't know what that point would be, but this is an interesting design that I hadn't thought of before. You know, what's the anti-Facebook algorithm, the anti, not engagement algorithm, but the anti rabbit hole polarization algorithm. And could you move people in a direction based on choosing? So today I speak to you, and we have slightly different views and my mind has changed a little bit and I'm not threatened and I'm feeling good and I've learned something. And then I go to someone who challenges me even more and then even more and then even more. That might open my mind in a way. It'd be interesting to design a social network that had as its goal to expand 
people's what what's the brief understanding of others tolerance of others exposure to others that's that's not enough but agency is key and we ain't got it right now there was a good movie on netflix uh, called as the circle uh, which had like tom hanks and emma watson in it so basically now that i think about our discussion from today and kind of related to the movie uh, the movie had like uh, you know illusion of a decision making system where all the people who were associated with that company were making decisions to kind of get themselves under surveillance uh, so that whenever they feel low it's like uh, they wanted to uh, eliminate the feeling of loneliness altogether it's like someone's al- always watching you for the good like in case if you're in trouble there'll be someone watching but what they didn't know is that every someone is always watching so even when there are times of when you want that privacy the subconscious privacy there is someone watching you so it was like yes. the illusion of giving the agent decision to make that decision but still taking away the decision altogether so i guess that's one good thing of an illusive illusive cybernetic system so yeah okay. yeah i i should look that up it's called the circle yeah the circle okay. i i'll try to find the link in let's see great or on netflix i can find it on netflix that's great that sounds like fun uh i have, i have a question so uh, you, you talked about how it's based a lot cybernetics based on a lot on interactions and it's a two way channel right it's not like one machine telling you what to do or making decisions for you um and as a collective we've gotten so used to this that people are not even thinking about it twice and designers or engineers are designing keeping this as the baseline but what would be a good place to experience cybernetics like the outcome of it uh and would that be a nudge to people to adapt it or consider or even start the conversation of adapting it since you mentioned that it's not as popular as ai or ml and uh, or data science like that whole umbrella of things that we're built on right now i don't have a satisfying answer to your question and i appreciate the question a lot which is how could people experience it you know we have speaker series in the american society for cybernetics you know there are books here and there that's not very experiential the closest thing is this desire i've mentioned a couple of times which is to create a repository of examples that others could come to and experience um but it should be more than just papers uh or prototypes it in fact i was talking about this today serena was in this meeting can we create experiences around cybernetics that would immerse people in situations that would allow them to feel the differences that we're talking about and we don't have such answers now but uh, but i would love to see it go in that direction you're you're anticipating a need that we haven't yet filled yet so you're you're living in the future thank you thank you There, there's one other um thing let me put this in so this page it has an abstract and a video and also a pdf and here to some extent i go into this question of what is the digital culture we talked about one aspect which is the nature of intelligence residing and there are a couple of other examples and for each one i talk about uh how to think of recommendation engines as being limited in that way and how they could be opened up and made to give more human agency and that also presents the idea of this project which i'm calling new macy in homage to the original macy meetings that i referred to earlier which were at the core of cybernet and my homepage also has other newer examples than that but again to the limit of your interest you can take a look at that if you wish Yes. I I have another question. Um very simple one. Does the user even want agency? Does the user want agency? Yeah. It's a good I've done a few product usability tests and the assumption there is assume that the user is dumb. <laughs> Make it as simple as possible so yeah just relate so to that. It should be a decision for the user to decide whether they want agency or not. It should not be a decision of the designer or of the company 
So sure, a lot of times, you know, I, I get a suggestion from a recommendation and I say, okay, but I don't have the right to not say, okay, right? I don't have the right, again, all the agency things that we're talking about here. So the possibility of agency is what maintains a human to human interaction, right? You might make a suggestion, let, you know, let's go to see the movie. I say, okay, am I giving up agency? Well, sort of. But also, I might know you, I might trust you, and so on. Or I might just say, yeah, let's try it. I have no idea what that is. But again, I get to choose rather than no choice is allowed. Was there someone else? I think, was it Shasha who wanted to come in for a minute? Did you have something? I know we're coming up to time. I, I'm okay. I don't know if you end at the exact moment. I just want to ask a quick question on um, what are the examples of project that is guided by uh, cybernetics uh, these days? Um, so there are some design examples from architecture. There's some of my work. Um, I talked at length about one of the, one of the things. Um, and there's a lot of work in a given field like sociology or anthropology, which takes a cybernetic view in the work it does, in the way it does research, in the way it formulates models and that kind of thing. So, I mean, that's the general answer. It isn't as rich. There aren't as many examples as there would be uh, for a non-cybernetic point of view. I mean, there are thousands of papers on machine learning and AI, literally thousands. Uh, but the number of papers on cybernetics about a computational approach and so on are very few. Um, I, I don't have a better way to answer that. Let me segue to a general invitation. If you want to pursue further questions with me, just send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. What was it about what we talked about? And so if you had a specific field in which you wanted to ask that question, I could or I could find someone if it's not exactly in my area um, part, as part of the society and, and colleagues and so on. I do this all the time. Like Serena asks me a question occasionally and I write to a colleague and they have very specific ideas. I'd love to use the network to help you if you have curiosity about that. Thank you. Thank you. As part of that invitation, I wanted to say that Gordon Pask, after he would give a very, very long lecture, uh, would say at the very end that conversations never end. And he means this in a couple of different ways. One is that we have started a conversation now, at least some of you I've not met before. And the conversation can continue. That's the invitation to come and contact me and tell me what you're thinking You know, two months or two years from now. I'm not kidding curious about where you're going with it all. But also the conversation continues in each of us, right? So you heard some things that you didn't know, you kind of remembered some of it, you have a point of view of your own, somebody said something else. That's a form of conversation internally, and that will keep going. And maybe there's a change that's occurred as a result of this 90 minutes that will cause you to take a path that you otherwise wouldn't. But in any event, the, the energy is there, the vector will continue individually in all of us. So please enjoy it. And I hope it's been worthwhile. I've enjoyed it. I appreciate your time and attention. Stay in touch. Stay in touch. That's, a, that's a great note to end on. Um, a couple of final things to, to wrap up tonight. First, I would love to take a group photo of everyone. Um, if you have, if you are okay with Cam on, yeah, go ahead and uh, tidy up. I'll count down from three. All right, three, two, one. Okay, nice. Okay. And then I just wanna do a little reminder for the club's next event. It's going to be happening the weekend after spring break. It's another Dine and Discourse format like this. It's going to be with Professor Jackie McFarland from School of Architecture on the topic of Afrofuturism. Um, we have not sent out a link to sign up yet, but that'll be coming this week. So keep an eye out on the Slack for that. Other than that, um, that's that's it for tonight. I've kept a I've kept track of the links that were sent. So in our channel on Slack, I'll be sending those along with a link to the recording. Um, but yeah, as as Paula said, feel free to reach out to him privately if you have more questions to follow up. Um, and would also love any suggestions that you guys have via Slack. Let us know how it went tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. I love the feedback. It's part of the loop. Yes. 
always. <laughs> Wonderful to see you all. Thanks so much. Have a great Thank evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for organizing, Trina. Of course. Did you stop recording? <laughs>